welcome to the show. And as you see, I've made a few changes this week to mark International Women's Day. Across the world, this day has been celebrated for more than a century and indeed can be traced right back to 1908 when 15,000 women marched through New York City demanding voting rights and better paying conditions. That campaign continues to this day. And I'll be interviewing equality campaigner Helen Pankhurst, whose grandmother and great-grandmother led the suffragette movement in the United Kingdom. Indeed, today's show includes interviews with three remarkable individuals, each of whom, in quite different ways, are making a contribution to enhancing the position of women. But first, here's Alex with your tweets, your messages and your emails. Well, lots of reaction to our trilogy of programmes on, on Ireland and, and Brexit. Baltic Boat says, brought back very sad memories to me, listening to Mary McAleese talk of the troubles in Northern Ireland. Me, a 13-year-old son of a Scot, a British Army soldier, lived in Lisbon for two years in 1969. Shops, swimming pools, cars blown up all around us, people tarred and feathered. Terrible. A Rob uh, says, just watched the Alex Salmon show's triptych, well, triptych is a great word, Rob, of broadcast focusing on Ireland and the consequences of Brexit. They pull off being informative and entertaining. And Charles MacDonald backs that up by saying, watch the repeat of the interview with Mary McAleese this morning, part of the, the trilogy of programmes about Ireland. Excellent. And Free Scott adds, another great show. The interviews with Bertie Hearn, Mary Lou MacDonald and Mary McAleese were a delight. If only Theresa May had the vision and insight of these three, the UK wouldn't be in such a mess. And from Davy Lane, who, who says, much praise for various John Major interviews this week. But Alex Salmon's interview of the former president of Ireland, Mary McAleese, was better. It watched to understand Ireland, her border, and why it's so important to support the EU project and to fear Brexit. Lynn Finlayson says, Hi Alec, could you please see if you can interview the proclaimers? I'm going to see them later in the year. Keep up the great work. Well, I'll tell you Lynn, uh, let's uh, tell uh, Charlie and Craig, the, the proclaimers, that's a, an open invitation to come on the Alex Salmon show. Uh, and finally from Lawrence Winston, uh, I'm really enjoying the show and in particular the last three episodes and the impact of Brexit in Ireland. Great presentation style. Uh, a pleasure to watch your show. Well, thank you very much, Lawrence. Now back to Taz, where you'll notice that normal service in the set has been resumed. Among the star turns at last Sunday's March for Women in London was a speaker with the most famous name of all in the historic struggle for women's rights. However, she has a formidable record in her own right of equality campaigning. And I'm delighted to be joined by her today. Welcome, Helen Pankhurst. And happy International Women's Day. It's a pleasure to be broadcasting on such an important day for women. Thank I want you. to start and ask you a bit about your heritage. As we all know, you are the great granddaughter of and granddaughter of um, Emmeline Pankhurst and Sylvia Pankhurst, respectively. How much of an influence has been related to the leaders of the British suffragette yeah. movement had on your life? How could you not be influenced by two such amazing people and, you know, carrying the surname? It had to be part of what I did with my life. And, you know, they were so amazing because of what they did in the past. But the fact is that that's still relevant today. The issue of women's rights resonates through the ages. So that name is not just part of history. It's part of the present. Absolutely. And of course, this is a quite an important year, 2018. We've seen the anniversary of certain women having yeah. uh, the right to vote um, earlier on this year. November will bring, I think, the anniversary on the 21st of the first women being able to stand uh, for Parliament. So a great year, I suppose, uh, for your book to come out, which came out on the 6th of February, yeah. uh, on the anniversary of women, certain women owning property, having yeah. the right to vote. And you're getting some great reviews. Tell us a bit about the book. Yeah. So the book has got three aspects, I suppose. Deeds Not Words, I should say, is the name of the That's book. That's right. Deeds Not Words, the story of women's rights then and now. So it's in three parts. The first bit, the prologue, looks at how we got to 1918, and that's a personal reflection on my family's background and the whole suffrage campaign. And it's such an exciting and interesting issue, um, one that increasingly I think women are learning or girls are learning at school, and that's important so that we, we keep that alive. So it's a personal perspective on how we got to 1918. And then the body of the book is thematic on issues such as politics, um, what's been happening since, such as women in the workplace, what's been happening, what are the key stories that women told me about, it's full of anecdotes. The third is about women's domestic life, their personal relationships, their family, their health, their sense of identity. And what was interesting as I did all of 
of that, and I pulled it, um, I then conclude on issues around power, is that violence against women kind of infects all the other aspects of women's lives. So as we think about how much things have or haven't changed, that issue about violence against women in the workplace, you know, in the political sphere, at home, in culture, um, you can't go very far in terms of thinking of how much we've progressed without identifying violence as a key constraint. There are a number of uh, okay, so there are council elections coming up, there are a number yeah. of by-elections going on um, in Scotland and you know, I will knock doors and women will say to me, I'm not going to vote, mm -hmm. I don't want to vote, m women and men, but yeah. because we're talking specifically about women today, yeah. how do you think we tackle that yeah. hard and hard won success yeah. of getting women the right to vote? Really, really important question. Um, so a number of thoughts. I mean, firstly, it's approximately the same number as men and women that vote. There's about one percentage difference over time, and it goes both ways. Sometimes it's slightly more men, sometimes it's slightly more women. So we shouldn't just say there are fewer women. I think we feel that women have fought so recently so hard for it that they really should. But then we can also ask, given how poorly the system represents their interests, you know, maybe it's not surprising that they're not voting. Indeed. If they're not reflect, reflected by the policies and by the people there, maybe it's really surprising that so many women do vote. But what I would say to all the women and the young girls out there is it's a habit. And it's a really, really important habit. It's a habit that links you to your society and to your country. Globally, we only have two countries where there are at least the same number of women represented in Parliament as men. 2018, only two countries that have both a male and a female lens as t in terms of who you look at and what policies are implemented. And so for me, that is really a sad indictment of where we are, and that really must change. You, like I, encourage women continuously, and there's some great projects out there. There's the 50-50 Project, the yeah. Parliament Project, Women for Independence, so many um, organisations, with the support of men also encouraging women to come into politics. But then we have to be aware that once you do enter politics, yeah. there's another world with which unfortunately mm. women are having to deal at the moment and support needs to be offered mm. in relation to that. What do you think can be done from a social media perspective, from all of the platforms yeah. that exist to yeah. offer women greater protection, then of course that will be act as an encouragement to bring them into politics yeah. in the first place? I think there's so much that can be done at different levels. I think parties have a responsibility for support. I think this, the government has a responsibility to support any woman that starts to emerge and to encourage them. I think that um, the med those who provide media platform, who after all are now saying they can identify um, uh, the language around terrorism and they can do something about that, well, why can't they identify a mechanisms to um, really do something decent and proper about all this vilification of women on their social media? So I think at every level, if we challenge it, and I think also there's a somehow there's a permissiveness of speaking in very unpleasant ways that has been allowed in social media and may be allowed in society more generally. And I think that has to stop. I think that, you know, there is a decency about how we need to talk to each other and listen to each other across our differences and we need to promote that and we all can promote that. We can disagree with people but we have to listen and we have to be able to express that disagreement in a, in a, in a, in a, in a decent way, not with abuse. People feel that they have an increased opportunity to be negative and to say yeah. nasty, racist yeah. uh, things to people. And if there's one thing the last couple of years have done, is just as it has given power and voice to some of that really negative things, it has given power and voice to those who say enough. Just enough is enough and we're going to stand up and shoulder to shoulder we're going to march and we are going to support each other and the whole Me Too campaigns that ev every day in the media. And for the last you know, months, every day, there's a new item that is speaking truth to this idea of saying enough to all this discrimination, wherever it's occurring, and let's stand up for something better because we can change things. So the positive angle on all of this is that because some things start moving backwards, enough people, and the world is divided up you know, in a way by most people who are in that middle and don't do much. And if most people wake up to the dangers and say, OK, we're going to side with a more positive world, which is more supportive of each other, then we can end in a better place. What would you say we need to do now okay. uh, to continue that cause, which, as I say, is it's, it changes as time goes on because different challenges come our way and yeah. we have to face, face those. What do you think we need to be doing now to make sure the world is a better, safer, fairer, more equal place for women? So firstly, there's the, the, um, 
the issue of legal change. So an act, an act 100 years ago started to change things. Not everything, as we were talking earlier, we had to wait another 10 years for equal rights, but the acts of parliament, the acts around violence against women, the acts about equal pay, incredibly important, and we need to keep doing those. But they only happen if individuals start to push for change, and they only happen if society also acknowledges change. So individual agency, yours, mine, everybody else's, standing up for something that's better and doing something is really important. But individuals don't change. It's society together that changes. So for me, the tighter we can knit those three aspects, individuals saying enough, society saying, oh yeah, maybe we can change, and laws that that, that ground that. If we can do all those three things, then, then we achieve change. And when I was in, in Parliament, elected to Parliament, and was going through a very difficult time because of high levels of social media abuse, threats to my life, threats to my family, etc., I received a card from you, signed by you personally, just telling me to, to keep going. And I wanted to let you know how much that meant to me, and I'm very grateful for it. Thank you for mentioning that because um, that card, it was actually the idea that we could, a group of women, just it's actually the Olympic suffragettes, so women that came together through uh, volunteering at the Olympics and other friends, we just thought the people today, women today who stand up get so much abuse, it's the same type of abuse as the suffragettes used to get 100 years ago and if we could offer some kind of support, maybe, just maybe that might help. So a number of us got together in a house and we just signed and sent it to all the women MPs irrespective of political uh, backgrounds and I just think that sometimes individual actions like that of support and appreciation can go a long way. In my book there's a quote of an 11 year old girl and she's saying she'd like to see um, that young girls don't only dream of becoming uh, princesses and uh, fairies but also astronauts and superheroes. So if we can support each other's dreams um, as parents, as workers, as, as members of the general public then I think by the end of the 10 years we can be proud of what we've done not just of what women did for us 100 years ago. Well, more power to you, Elbon. Thank you for all that you do. It started many, many years ago with your, with your great-grandmother, whom she'll be extremely proud of all that you've done to, to continue her name. Thank you very much indeed, Helen Pankhurst. Pleasure. Thank you. Fascinating stuff from Helen Pankhurst. Join us after the break, when Alex will be back to interview Tricia Marwick, the first woman presiding officer of the modern Scottish Parliament. And I'll be speaking to Leanne Brown, a woman who is currently making the transition from reality TV star to campaigner against poverty and the oppression of women. Welcome back. There now have been two women prime ministers in the United Kingdom, but only one Madam Speaker in the near 800 year history of the Westminster Parliament. However, the modern Scottish Parliament has been much better at breaking through the political glass ceiling. In Edinburgh, I spoke to Tricia Marwick, presiding officer of the Scottish Parliament from 2011 to 2016. Tricia, the woman responsible for keeping me in order as First Minister, explained first that, that gender was not the only barrier that she had to overcome. Tricia Marwick, you were five years as presiding officer of the, the Scottish Parliament between 2011 and 2016. Now, you were the first woman in the mm, chair of mm, the, the, the Scottish mm, Parliament as presiding officer, mm. at least. Uh, although, because Winifred Ewing, the Indeed. redoubtable SMP, was the first person in the chair because she was the uh, the mother of the most experienced member way back. You in mean the life. oldest? Well, the, the, I was trying to, Winnie might be watching, and I was trying <laughs> to choose my words carefully. Uh, but, uh, but as presiding officer, you were the first woman mm, in the chair. Mm. Uh, did you feel that was ever an issue, or, or had the Scottish Parliament developed in such a way that it really was of no matter? People say to me, it must be a huge thrill for you uh, to be the first woman presiding officer of the Scottish Parliament. And of course it was. Um, but I used to say to the, in response to that, yes, but I was also the first presiding officer who did not go to a private school. I was the first presiding officer know that. who had a working class background. I did not go to university. Um, so lots of things to be proud of. So certainly proud about being the first woman, but I'm certainly proud of being able to represent a great proportion of the people of Scotland. Of course, the, the Scottish Parliament has been blessed with some formidable uh, uh, women campaign, not just the late Margaret MacDonald or Winnie Ewing, uh, but the First Minister now, Nicola Sturgeon, the, the leader of the, the opposition, Ruth uh, Davidson. In my time, the Annabel Goldie was uh, 
leader of the, the Conservative and a number of key Labour politicians as well. The nature of the Parliament, the, the hours of the Parliament, the, the working practices do make it, uh, compared with many other parliaments in the world, some of which we won't mention, but other parliaments are pretty friendly to, to, to people with, well, child caring responsibilities. I think because we became a parliament in 1999 um, and there was a great desire to make sure that we didn't have the situation at Westminster where hardly any woman had ever been elected, there was a great um, push by the parties themselves to make sure that we got women elected. That was easier because there was no incumbents to get rid of. So we went in... No male incumbents to get no rid of. There was no male incumbents to get rid of um, because I find that once men are in the seats, they just refuse to move. Um, so it was a brand new opportunity. It's very difficult for a woman who um, has got to go to, say, Westminster, for example, hundreds of miles away when they've got ridiculous uh, voting hours. Uh, you know, they could be voting at any time at night. And we've always had one point in the day at five o'clock where a vote is held. And I think that's really, really important. And I think the importance of women being there um, can be seen in the kinds of legislation that were enacted about domestic violence um, and the like. There was a much greater emphasis on issues to do with women, to do with family, to do with vulnerable people than anything we'd really seen at Westminster. You were very seriously ill mm. when you were presiding officer mm. uh, and yet continued in post without people I think being aware of just how serious your condition was. Mm. Uh, you were, one or two of us were privileged to, to, to be told by you but not many. Mm. So tell us a bit about how you confronted that, uh, that illness and determined that you could still continue in post and be effective as presiding officer. It was pretty appalling. Um, in actual fact, the worst time uh, was before I was diagnosed with bowel cancer. Um, so for a period from about April to June before I got the diagnosis, I was very ill. And then in June, um, that's when I was diagnosed with bowel cancer and had to you know, have an operation practically two days afterwards. And you, of course, um, I phoned up you know, out of courtesy and, of course, a long-standing friendship uh, to let you know how ill I was. Um, so I had the operation in June. Um, I was off for about three weeks. Luckily, we went into recess then for the summer. Um, I was having chemotherapy. And when I came back at the beginning of... the end of August, beginning of September... And which year was this? This, this is 2013. Mm -hmm. um, when I came back, I was still having chemotherapy. Um, and the only people who knew at that stage were my private staff in the office because they were looking after me, my family and very few others. But, you know, it was important that I didn't tell anybody just how ill I was because it comes down to the fact that you can't show weakness in the chair. If people had known I was in the chair, they would have done two things. They would have held back from being as rough and boisterous as it should be, um, or secondly, they would take advantage of it. And I just thought it was really, really important to keep that firm grip on it. And the only way I could do that was not telling anybody. There was also, of course, the fear that I wasn't going to get better. And that, you know, I wanted to handle this in my own way. I, I would say that uh, next to nobody realised uh, the seriousness of your, your illness who hadn't been told. It was a great tribute to the, to the way you handled it. Thank you. Trisha Marwick, after five years in the, in the chair of the Scottish Parliament, now retired as uh, presiding officer, what advice would you give, not to your successor, because you can't give individual advice like that, but to anybody who aspires to, to be in the, the chair of the, the Scottish Parliament in the future, what, what would you say the, the key thing is to be a successful presiding officer? Well, I think I was really lucky um, because uh, you appointed me in 1999 to be the Deputy Business Manager sitting on the Bureau um, of the Parliament where um, all the business is done. Um, and then I was very fortunate that the Labour Minister and uh, Business Manager was Tom Cape, who was an operator. And I understood so much more from him uh, than, you know, than I could ever imagine. He, he, was, he was brilliant. 
I knew standing orders back to front. So when I did become the presiding officer, um, I knew the standing orders so well that if you know any of the clerks or anybody was giving me advice, they had to know that I was going to um, challenge them if necessary. So the first place of advice is know the rules. If know the rules. If you're going to enforce Absolutely. the referee, you should know the rules. The referee should know the rules better than anybody else. Uh, because once you know that, um, you have got the comfort of knowing you can fall back into it. And I hate myself for saying this, right, because um, my kids will be busy shouting, saying, what about us, what about us? But I think, you know, it is the greatest thing I've done in my life. Tricia Barwick, one, one more point of, uh, of interest, and that, of course, not quite equivalent to being presiding officer of the Scottish <laughs> Parliament, but for, for this lovely interview, you get the Alex Salmon quake for being on the show. Thank you. I have, I have given away so many of them in the past. Uh, and, you know, I think this is one of the few that I've actually received. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you so thank much. You. Leanne Brown came to prominence as the wife of Manchester United footballer Wes Brown. She established her own TV career in the hugely popular Real Housewives of Cheshire, before now making a further transition into an activist against the economic and physical oppression of women by her support for the charity One Woman at a Time. Leanne joins me now. Welcome. Thank you. And happy International Women's Day to you. Say to you. Um, thank you very much uh, for joining us here. We're really keen to talk to you about your journey from what I suppose you were termed during the time when Wes uh, Brown was playing for Manchester United as the wife of Wes Brown. Yeah. To now being the amazing charity activist that you are working internationally and of course in the middle finding some time for three uh, lovely young ladies <laughs> young girls uh, and also uh, working in the reality tv show uh, the real housewives of cheshire tell us a little bit about your journey i've always done charity work i've always done fundraisers i'm a patron of another charity called once once upon a smile and um, just recently one called tiger lily trust they're both like bereavement charities but the one woman at a time, it was a lady called Jean Anderson. Um, she's the founder, a lady that I've known for about seven years. Mm -hmm. She did my hypnobirthing with my youngest child, Lola, and we reconnected about 18 months ago, and she lived in Africa. She's an ex-midwife. She told me about her work and the FGM, and something just really resonated within me that I wanted to help. In Africa, it's about the FGM and um, early marriage. So we basically sponsor girls to get an education and, and any course that they can do just to get their own independence, earn their own money, so they don't have to be sold, they don't have to marry. Also with the female genital mutilation, I just think it's so important to be able to empower the girls and explain what's going to happen so they, they can have their own voice and stand up and say no. Obviously there are lots of charities that they're working with women and, uh, and children, UNICEF, Save the Children, Care for example. What sets the charity One Woman at a Time apart for you? Well the three main areas that, that we're looking at is obviously sponsoring the girls for education, um, the hospital, the maternity bit, the, um, the babies. I mean in this hospital, in this village, there's no running water in the hospital and um, it's just crazy what how babies survive in there and you think how clean like the hospitals are here and you just have to deal with what they have got so the maternity side of it with the um, we hope to train midwives to be able to have um, to staff more staff that speak their own language in that area as well so that's really important and also we managed to take over some washable sanitary towels when we went over there this time um, these I mean, some of the girls, they have to miss school if they're um, on their menstrual cycle because, and, or even some, sometimes you use newspaper because they don't have any facilities. Um, and these uh, sanitary towels are just, they're, they're so good and they last over 12 months and they're so e easy to use. Uh, so we did a demonstration with the girls and um, showed them how to use them and we're hoping to find out the materials that that they use and be able to then, then make their own. Does any of that take an emotional toll on you? Because not only are there women who may be men in a long line, succession line of, of women who've been in a marriage to a, certain, to a particular gentleman, but also very young, young brides, mm. uh, the age of, of our children, I suppose, sometimes. Do, do you... Do you find that quite difficult to deal with when you it, see that firsthand? It's, it's horrendous. I mean, these girls in Africa, they are like 13, 13, 14, when they're told they're becoming a woman 
and it's like a rite of passage ceremony and they have a big party and then that's, I mean, they don't even know what's going to happen to them. One girl um, called Salome, um, somebody who Jean met in the refuge, told her story of um, she overheard her parents talking about it and there was um, an old man in the room and she was led to believe that this was going to be the man she was going to marry and she'd escaped in the middle of the night, lived out in the bush for um, a few months and got found and now we're helping her and um, she's now done, had some schooling and now she's doing further education so we got to meet her and it's just it just makes my heart sing to be able to meet the girls and, and be on the ground and see what, what's being done. I mean, speaking of International Women's Day, I mean, this country, we've come so far with 100 years mm. and with the voting and everything. And But just to go there and see that like, these women have no rights. And of course, just this weekend, we, we must mention, you had your first ball, the Empowerment Ball, yes. to, in Manchester to raise money. Yeah. For, is this for the, for the, the one, one woman at a time, time, yeah. time charity? How did that go? I did all the um, organising and like literally nearly everybody I knew in the room. So it was um, it was daunting, but it was just the overwhelming the donations, the generosity of everyone. I mean, raised in the region of about thirty thousand pounds. So Which I'm is fantastic. so over the moon with that. Can I just take you on to, to India? Obviously, increasingly, and I hope this is the case, that Wes is being known as your husband now, <laughs> given your success with your, your charity work. But he's obviously playing football uh, in India. How is that working for you, that, that you're here, sometimes in Africa, sometimes in India, uh, managing that sort of family balance, trying to keep everything together? We just make it work as a family. And um, in fact, it's just probably made us stronger as a couple, having to deal with living apart and, and makes the time together all the more precious. And you successfully managed to find charity work to do in India yeah. to make that work. So With India, it's more about the abuse, the domestic abuse, sexual abuse, and um, obviously connecting with the refuge over there because of Wes's um, career, football career now in India. With Wes, I'm so um, overwhelmed at how he's took on board what I'm doing and he got involved with the refuge in India and he's took a couple of his teammates over there to meet and they've now asked him to be um, ambassador of the Save the Children campaign over there. Well, all power to Leanne, it's a, a wonderful story and uh, good luck with all of the excellent work that I know Thank you're going you. to do and also with bringing up what are no doubt three lovely young ladies yes, too. They are. Thanks so much. Thank you. While Europe's eye is fixed on mighty things, the fate of empires and the fall of kings, while quacks of state must each produce his plan, and even children lisp the rights of man, amid this mighty fuss just let me mention, the rights of women still merit some attention. So happy International Women's Day, and from Taz and me and all at the show, it's goodbye, for now.